And one of my arguments about modern Western culture would be, we've been schooled to think of ourselves as individuals. And we've been schooled to think of the meaning of life as happiness. And we've been schooled to think of virtue as not getting in the way of somebody else's happiness as long as nobody's being hurt. When you think that way, you have no way to resist the kind of moves that the politicized LGBTQ move, uh, movement has been making in our wider culture. It goes against everything you believe in to say to somebody, no, you can't be that, or no, you can't do that if it makes them unhappy. So I think Protestantism's general acculturation to the broader uh, therapies, for want of a better term, of society at large have left her horribly vulnerable to the inroads of the culture at this particular point. Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by... Emma Waters, the coalition's manager of American Moment. This is the first time you've been on since your name changed. It is. There you go. So uh, <laughs> this is official uh, proof in in uh, in podcasting, which is the only format that really matters, that Emma got married a few months ago. So be sure to send her congratulations about that. And uh, we had on a fantastic guest today to talk about adjacent topics to marriage and family, namely all the forces in American society seeking to destroy them. Uh, but before we get to that, as always, go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find information about all of the programs and wonderful things that we have cooking the backlog of this podcast, which is on like 54 episodes now, just enormous amounts of content from everyone like uh, people like Professor Truman to uh, people like Steve Bannon to people like Congressman Jim Banks and everything in between. <laughs> so uh, it's an eclectic mix, um, I like to think. And uh, I don't think we have any live applications or anything right now. The Fellowship for American Statecraft is closed. Foundations of American Statecraft is well underway, but there's always new stuff coming on. So be sure to join our mailing list and you'll be able to to, to see what we have cooking. I think we're trickling out some of the speeches from Up From Chaos, Conserving American Security. Um, I'm, I'm projecting out into the future as I say this, so that's why I'm uh, a little bit unsure what we have on there, but we do have plenty. Uh, be sure to rate and review this podcast. As always, five stars helps us uh, get boosted in the rankings and stops the demons from uh, you know trying to, to take this podcast down by, by giving it one star, which definitely does happen. Uh, our, our rating recently fell from 4.7 to 4.6, so please help us. Let's get it back to 4.7. Um, Emma, why don't you talk a little bit about who we had on today? His formal bio is that he's a, a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in their Evangelicals and Civic Life program. Uh, he's a professor at Grove City College. He's the author of The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. But you're more familiar with his work than I am. Yes, absolutely. So uh, Dr. Truman uh, spent his early years growing up in UK, which is going to come out in the episode in the most amusing ways. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you're one of these people who likes to just experience the auditory joy of hearing a British person talk about basically anything, this is the episode for you. Precisely. And everyone's favorite topic, the queen, may she, well, hopefully still be alive um, <laughs> at this point in the episode coming out. So he uh, spent most of his career writing on uh, pre and post reformation um, theology and history. And in recent years became very interested and concerned by the cultural movements that we're seeing in the United States and globally from transgenderism um, to sort of this therapeutic understanding of the self um, and the ways that we have politicized everything and most importantly, politicized sex itself um, for minors and children, as well as for adults um, and the understanding of men and women who they are. Um, so he is a wonderful leader um, for evangelical Christians, sort of in the Protestant space, and is becoming one of, I think, the main thinkers as we're looking at transgenderism, not as this isolated phenomenon that came out of nowhere, like your grandparents, like, this was not around in my day. What are we doing here? But in reality, he's able to trace something going back hundreds of years of these movements within the way we intuitively think about uh, human nature and the human self and our relation to other people and our relation to the world um, and how this is actually the culmination of many shifts in those areas rather than just some random thing that's come out of nowhere and is going to leave just as quickly. This is a little bit more of an intellectual episode than many of the ones that we have on Moment of Truth. This is not one where there's going to be a thousand public policy proposals that come out of it, but it is one that helps, I think, understand a lot of the cultural and intellectual forces that brought us to this moment in time. And so um, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, enjoy uh, the British accent. Uh, I think it's our second British accent on the show <laughs> after Helen Bakari. And um, 
Enjoy the episode. We'll go now to Dr. Carl Truman. Dr. Truman, thank you for coming on the podcast. That's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. We always like to have people explain how they got to the point where they're doing what they are today. And you have a little bit of a funny accent, too. So why don't you tell us the story of how you how you got here? Well, it's a, it's a somewhat random story. By training, I'm a Reformation scholar. I did classics as an undergraduate, Reformation studies for my PhD, taught Reformation for many years in the UK, and then for 15 or 16 years at a seminary in the United States on the East Coast, uh, and then got interested in social and cultural, contemporary social and cultural issues, uh, partly because of events that were happening in the school district where my own kids had gone to school, and partly because I was brought on at the magazine First Things to, to start opining on the kind of issues that First Things speaks about, but from a, a more Protestant perspective sure. than was typical for them. So oddly, I started live as a Reformation scholar. Now I spend most of my life commenting on things like transgenderism, LGBTQ rights, contemporary issues uh, in the culture, for which I have no formal qualifications whatsoever, <laughs> other than the fact that as a trained historian, I think you learn to think critically about culture and cultural formation. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, a technique, a skill, a method that can be applied anytime, any place. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a an interesting point to make because it, th there is no way to be a formal scholar of transgenderism because it's such a novel phenomenon. Um, what what has that been like? I mean, going up against the people who claim authority on the capital S science, biologists as one has to be, you know, uh, but speaking to, to more classical themes. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think the you're alluding, I guess, to uh, the, the Supreme Court nominee's answer last week, which right. was interesting to me on a number of fronts in that one, it was very clear she was trying to, to pander to the progressive left on the issue. Mm -hmm. But in deferring the answer to biologists, she sort of conceded that there is an essentialist argument for the difference between men and women, mm -hmm. which indicates to me that she was deferring to progressives, but not actually that well schooled mm -hmm. in gender theory or, or where progressive thinking is coming from on this. I would say on the whole, when I speak on these issues, I'm speaking to the confused layperson. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the hardcore gender ideologues have such a strange and implausible view of the world that they are fundamentally unreachable in terms of argument. Any argument that I propose is likely to be dismissed as a, a cisgender, heteronormative, white male power play. So I don't speak to that kind of person. I'm writing to help the layperson, the man, woman in the street, the person who's facing this challenge in their workplace and is confused by it. I write to try to help them think clearly about the issues and see what is at stake. Now, the nexus of uh, Protestantism and these issues that you talk about is is not um, it's not facile. I mean, there there is a, a deep confusion, I think, within many Protestant churches as well um, on some of these cultural questions. It seems like um, many of sort of the establishment evangelical institutions in American life have been besieged by this culture war over the last twenty years, and they don't really know how to find uh, their footing in it. Tell us a little bit about what you've seen over the past maybe decade um, in responding to these issues and, and, and where that susceptibility comes from? Yeah, I've seen, uh, well, I'm seeing at the moment what I think is significant collapse on that issue. Mm -hmm. And I have very little confidence that many Protestant ins institutions will stand firm on it for a variety of reasons. I think uh, Protestants, particularly in the United States, have for the longest time assumed that they own the country. And they're now faced with an issue. They're now faced with the the issue that it's becoming very clear that they don't own the country anymore. And you can respond in one of two ways: that you can either become very angry and negative about things, or you can try to regain ground by conceding huge swathes of territory to the secular world. And I think we see in Protestantism those two responses. On the one hand, there is a, a strong, angry reaction against what's going on. On the other hand, we see major concessions being made to the culture, I think, in an effort to remain respectable. Secondly, I think Protestantism does not stand apart from the culture. And one of my arguments about modern Western culture would be, we've been schooled to think of ourselves as individuals, and we've been schooled to think of the meaning of life as happiness, and we've been schooled to think of virtue as not getting in the way of somebody else's happiness as long as nobody's being hurt. When you think that way, 
you have no way to resist the kind of moves that the politicized LGBTQ move, uh, movement has been making in our wider culture. It goes against everything you believe in to say to somebody, no, you can't be that, or no, you can't do that, if it makes them unhappy. So I think Protestantism's general acculturation to the broader uh, therapies, for want of a better term, of society at large have left her horribly vulnerable to the inroads of the culture at this particular point. And so this culminates um, in the recent books that you've been writing. Um, so what are these books? And tell us um, what you're talking about in particular there. Well, the, the major book is entitled The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. The origins of that were uh, a couple of conversations I had, one with Rod Dreher, editor at the American Conservative, who approached me, I don't know, it must have been 2014, 15, sometime around then, asking if I would write an introduction to the sociologist Philip Reef's theory of culture. Reef is a very important sociologist, very important, really philosopher of culture, mm -hmm. but uh, very hard to read. He, he's not a great pro stylist, and Rod thought it would be good to have a a nice lucid introduction to him. So I started to read Reef at that point. At the same time, I was in conversation with Crossway, evangelical publisher, who were uh, suggesting that I might want to take Rod's idea up and run with it. Well, as I read Reef, it became clear to me that a more interesting project would be using Reef to try to develop a broader theory of culture to explain what's going on at the moment, particularly relative to the trans issue. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know why the statement, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, had come to make sense, not simply to you know, Judith Butler's postgraduate students, mm -hmm. but to the ordinary man or woman in the street who doesn't find that an inherently ridiculous statement anymore. I wanted to know what had gone on in our culture that had led to that position. I also wanted to know why it was that these changes that we were seeing around us were happening so fast. One of the things I think one is sensitive to as a historian is if dramatic changes are taking place fast, there have to be deep, long-standing underlying causes or influences at work. So I wanted to explore what is it that makes transgenderism in particular plausible Indeed, even a political imperative now as it's emerged in, in the last few years. So that's what the book uh, attempted to address. And it was really a, a history, I suppose, of a certain strands of Western thought relative to culture over the last three or four hundred years. Mm -hmm. Problem doesn't start three or four hundred years ago, but you got to—I got to start my story somewhere. Wherever I start, there's always going to be somebody who says, "Why didn't you start a generation before?" Have to start somewhere. So I started with Rousseau and looked at how, particularly Rousseau and Romanticism, deeply shape Western sensibilities uh, in terms of personhood and identity. Mm, that's very good. One of the questions that I'm always interested in is how do things that are the province of intellectuals of academics filter down to the regular everyday person. Um, there's often, um, for lack of a better term, a kind of boomerism that is operative in right wing circles in the United States, which says, oh, yes, the, the, the you know, people have read Derrida and Marx, and that's what made them all cultural Marxists. It's like, mm. that's obviously not true. There's there's stratum that these yeah. ideas get laundered uh, and ideated through and to the point where the ordinary person just kind of nods yeah. their head at the idea that I am a man trapped in a woman's body. How, what is that? What is your theory of that process? And and what is it that it boils down to in the mind of the everyday person? Yeah, it's you're you're asking the the sort of the, I suppose due to inflation, it's probably the sixty four million dollar question. <laughs> in history. You know, is it ideas or is it material? conditions that drive the way ordinary people think. And I think the answer ultimately is both. Yeah. And there's a complex relationship between the two of them. To, to sort of step back a bit, the, my book is, about two thirds of the book is what I would describe as intellectual genealogy. I'm dealing with the ideas of particular historical figures. Why do I deal with ideas? It's not because Rousseau thinks something, everybody reads Rousseau, everybody runs off, believes Rousseau, and that's how it works. It's because so much of the way we think about the world and relate to the world is intuitive. We, we don't think self-consciously about an awful lot of the way we relate to the mm. world. Most people who have moral standards have not read Kant on ethics. Mm -hmm. They've intuited a moral shape to the universe from the way they've been brought up, from the things they watched on television, et cetera, mm. et cetera. But focusing in on key thinkers allows us to look at people who have reflected very self-consciously on 
things that most of us merely intuit. Mm -hmm. And that helps us understand the significance, perhaps the origins, perhaps the, the outcomes of the intuitions that we have. So first of all, I want to say, I wrote an intellectual history, but that's not because I think everybody reads Nietzsche, runs off and puts Nietzsche into practice. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, how do these ideas come to grip the imagination? Well, I would say material factors help make some ideas more plausible than mm -hmm. others. Take transgenderism, for example. I don't want to be hammering on the transgender community, but take transgenderism because it's so radical and so counterintuitive. How does that come to grip the imagination? Well, I would say it can only do so in a world where it can be imagined. And it can only be imagined in a world where you have certain technologies. Mm -hmm. You have to have uh, the ability to, to gerrymander the body in such a way that a male body can be made to look like a female body and vice versa. It, it can only be imagined in a world where there is hormone therapy, where there are puberty blockers, where one is able to scientifically take hold of biological sex and claim to morph it into something else. So I would say technology plays a huge role in the way that the ideas that I look at in the book filter down. One of the big strands of the book is we tend to think of ourselves as free, autonomous individuals. Well, think about the way technology feeds into that. Um, I was talking at the American Enterprise Institute uh, just last night about music. So you know, think about the way music functions for us today. 200 years ago, music had to be something that you made as part of a group. Now it's something you consume as an individual. So the one of, one of my favorite, more esoteric ideas I read on the Internet from Twitter accounts with no name is that, you know, that, that, that there is something very particularly uh, harmful about a culture where, where that which was a, a luxury at the level of, you know, gold filigree or, or the finest wine mm. can now just be consumed at any time through earphones like music never was that in yeah. human history, like and all of a sudden it is. And what does that mean? And what were the consequences of it? And when, uh, one of the consequences, of course, is it is, is it, it reshapes the world around the individual. Mm -hmm. And you see this in dancing as well. There's a great little essay by the late English philosopher Roger Scruton on dancing where he compares the sort of dancing one might get in a Jane Austen costume drama to the dancing that one has in you know, Saturday Night Fever. That dates me, I know. Yeah. That's <laughs> an ancient movie from the 70s. Yeah. Footloose. It, yeah, <laughs> Footloose. In Jane Austen, the individual only makes sense when they learn the steps of the group. The individual has no significance by themselves. In Saturday Night Fever, John Travolta strutting his stuff in order to, to show that he is a unique individual. So these cultural, you, you're absolutely correct, these cultural products both reflect and mm -hmm. cultivate and reinforce a certain way of imagining the self to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the technological uh, the technological side is is I think interesting is that, that technology enables greater deviations from human flourishing as we have known it for millennia, um, or that it you know uh, creates them. I mean you know is is this are, are are these instincts to deviate latent in the human condition or or are they created by yeah. the existence of the technology? That's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, if you're a Christ, from a Christian perspective, then you, you move to the doctrine of original sin and you say, well, fallen humanity defaults to transgression. But you don't have to be a Christian to hold that view. Uh, Sigmund Freud held a very similar view, that uh, Freud makes the point that, that nothing, obeying no law, Gives the can give you the same pleasure as breaking a law. Transgression is the thing that most excites human beings. I, when I'm teaching at Grove, I sometimes say to the students, where you, if you see a movie, if you see video footage on the news of a riot in town, zero on the faces of the rioters. They're generally not angry. They're exhilarated and exultant because they're breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say, whether you're a Christian or whether you're a Freudian, or a son or daughter of Freud in some way. Transgression has an appeal that we tilt towards. We want to be sovereign. We want to make the world conform to our will, mm -hmm. and that makes us inevitably transgressive, mm -hmm. I think. But that seems to have, uh, the, the LGBTQ movement seems to be interested in de-transgressifying, -trans if that's a word, 
th the questions that they are bringing up, right? It's that, you know, that, I mean, let's take the gay issue, for instance, that there's sort of, um, I would say, two broad categories of, of uh, approach that, that that community has. One is sort of living on the edge as a transgressive entity at the, at the margins of society. And the second is seeking hyper-normalization of the kind that, say, a Pete yeah. Buttigieg does of, you know, we want to be married just like um, heterosexuals and, and so on. I, I mean, it, it, it seems like most of the legal and political and cultural fights around these issues is to make them more normal. How do you square that with the idea that this is based on an impulse to trans transgress? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think you do point to a division there in the community. Someone like Camille Pallier, for example, was very opposed to gay marriage on precisely those grounds, it domesticated. And when you look at the way uh, a political figure like Pete uh, Buttigieg, I'm, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce his name, Pete Buttigieg, yeah. <laughs> the way he was treated in some uh, parts of the gay press in the run-up to the uh, 2020 election, where they were dismissive of him as a poster boy for their movement, precisely because he fitted the the white middle-class conformity kind of picture. So certainly that's there. I, I think what you see, though, is that the movement itself, the loudest voices in the movement, always default towards a kind of radicalism. And it's why the L, the G, and the B are becoming increasingly marginalized within the movement. You know, Andrew Sullivan, 20 years ago, he's kind of a radical voice. Now he's a homophobe. Yeah. So I think when you're looking at the, at the political activists in the movement, you see the transgressive dimension very clearly. And at an ideological level, I think... Uh, intersectionality plays to this as well. That, okay, it's it's no longer enough to claim to be a gay man. What else? What else do you have? Where else are you transgressing norms or finding yourself on the wrong side of norms that will grant you a kind of credibility and status? So I think you're right, but I'm thinking certainly as a political movement, we see that push for transgression very much in the loudest voices. What, uh, what do you make of the response that so many people on the right seem to have in uh, opposition to these movements to just go to the capital S science, you know, uh, the biological essentialist answers. Oh, well, it's, you know, I, I saw a clip of Tucker Carlson's show the other day and he literally had up a, a chromosome chart and was, yeah. you know, this is about XX chromosomes. Yeah. There's something to me that seems like we're almost playing into their long game by, 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 yeah. by doing that. What, what do you make of you know, appealing to the science as opposed to to maybe the classical definitions that, yeah. that motivate your thought process on this? I think you have to be careful in the appeal to science. Uh, now, let me qualify that. I think that the nature of the female body as opposed to the male body is central to female identity. It strikes me that one can no more say that, say, the monthly cycle of menstruation doesn't affect how women experience the world uh, any more than one could say the color of an African-American skin doesn't affect the way they experience the world. So being a woman has to be more than a psychological construction. And we know as, as complex as the science is, particularly relative to the very, very small number of cases that don't conform to the standard biological paradigms, we know there are complexities there. Uh, but I think at the core, there has to be a biological component, a central biological component to the definition uh, of men and women. Having said that, we do need to acknowledge that the construction of manhood and womanhood varies from culture to culture. Uh, I grew up in 1980s uh, England, and the uh, the concept of manhood that, that my father taught me was that of uh, you're to be reserved, you're not to show your emotions, uh, you are to be uh, a quiet and sort of self-sufficient. That's not 1980s American manhood. So we do have to acknowledge, I think, that yeah, the critical theorists have something going for them when they point to the social construction of the way we understand manhood and womanhood. What we need to avoid is being forced into a kind of either-or situation. Either it's all biology or it's all social construction. I want to say no. I want to say that a woman's body is central to what it means to be a woman, shapes how she experiences the world, but also the cultural context and historical context in which a woman finds herself shape that as well.
I would add to that as well the spiritual component of it. Um, so in C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy and Paralandria, at the very end, he has this magnificent paragraph where Ransom, the main character, is sort of musing on his experience on this foreign island. And he comes to this realization that gender and sex are not simply biological things. There is necessarily a biological manu- uh, manifestation of it, but it's reflecting a higher spiritual truth that goes far beyond our, our ability to even adequately consider conceive of it. So when our forefathers in various cultures called mountains masculine names and they called the earth feminine, this wasn't them simply taking a a man and then like projecting it onto the mountain. But I think it was this intuitive perception um, of of, of what gender is beyond just the physical bodies. And I think that's sometimes where conservatives or people on the right have gotten themselves in trouble is where they reduce the transgender issue to something that's specifically materialist or about biology apart from like the greater spiritual reality that it is reflecting. And so it takes both like the psychological understanding and submission to the biological and the biological in an understanding of the larger spiritual context. I think to have a conversation um, going forward for conservatives of like how you sort of reclaim this conversation and lead people to a better understanding. Um, But there's something on this too. So you write a lot about Philip Reef as you talked about at the beginning, um, and he has this first, second, and third world breakdown. Um, So would you talk a little bit about the first, second, and third world and what that means for how conservatives or even how Christians are articulating these issues? Yes, it's a very important distinction in Reef's later work, first, second, and third worlds. First thing to say is, when we hear the term third world, most of us default to thinking of the developing world. We, we think of it as an economic, a social and economic category. That's not how Reef is using the term at all. Reef is distinguishing three, we might say, three ways of conceptualizing the metaphysics of reality, for want of a better term. First worlds uh, uh, are worlds where he sees fate as ruling. And what does he mean by that? Well, we could go back to ancient Greece. The ancient Greece provides a kind of model for Reef's first world. Imagine you're growing up in Sparta, you're a young Spartan kid, you're being taught some of the, you know, this I did classics, there's some weird stuff going on in ancient Spartan culture. You're wondering why, you ask your parents and your parents will say to you, it's the law. You respond, well, so what? Why do I have to obey the law? Your parents say, well, you have to obey the law because uh, the snake god gave the law to the oracle at Delphi who handed it to the first king of Sparta, Lycurgus. So the law comes with divine sanction. That's the first world, a world where the moral order, the, the, uh, the moral order of the day is grounded in something that transcends uh, the material world. Second worlds are really, they're a sort of development of first worlds. They're a more sophisticated theological mm-hmm. account of law. And we could say uh, Islamic society would be a good example. Uh, ancient Israel would be a good example. Medieval Christendom would be good examples where the law codes by which society organize themselves carry authority because they're seen to reflect the character or the will of God. Mm -hmm. In other words, why shouldn't I kill? I should not kill because killing is destroying the image of God. God has come. So you ground your moral imperatives in a theological reality, in faith, Reef would say. And he's not talking about faith as in trust in Jesus. He's talking about faith as in the faith, a a sophisticated theological account of a divinely grounded reality. Third worlds, he says, are worlds where the transcendent has been lost. There is nothing beyond the world to justify the world. And what Reef says in that point in time Ethics and moral frameworks become inherently unstable because there is nothing beyond themselves to justify them. And he has a rather pessimistic comment at one point in in his work where he says, no society has ever managed to justify itself on the basis of itself. So you enter a period of great instability. The big practical issue, I think, for uh, conservatives on this would be, Reef would say, we're now living in a third world. Mm-hmm. Conservatives tend to live in a second world. Mm-hmm. And that means that the arguments that consider, particularly religious conservatives will use simply make no sense to a denizen of the third world. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's illegitimate to appeal beyond this world uh, to ground your ethical imperatives in, mm-hmm. in anything at all. So it leads to what Ma- Alistair McIntyre has, has, I think, correctly diagnosed as a mm-hmm. fundamental breakdown of the possibility of, of public discourse. and. Uh, McIntyre says, in this kind of world, a couple of things happen. One, people just start to shout louder. Mm 
look at Twitter. That would be sort of <laughs> evidence. People move to caps lock very quickly. And secondly, and this is interesting, uh, McIntyre says they start deferring to managerial elites. In other words, they defer to the experts. I have lost count over the last two years of the number of times in a number of spheres I've heard the phrase, the experts say, as if that is sufficient grounding for whatever position is, is being argued. So we live in a third world now, and the bad news is for those of us who hold to kind of second world principles, it means communication is going to be extremely difficult in the public square. The public square becomes an arena of a battle of raw power rather than a place where reasoned arguments can be made for the establishment of, of policy or principles. Yes. And it's precisely that critique of raw power. I think you see some conservatives on the right um, and potentially like old school conservatives who criticize people who are outspoken or who are attempting to use uh, legal or political power very strategically. Um, think uh, DeSantis's don't say gay bill hmm. in order to achieve certain ends. And they yeah. would say, no, this is just an inversion of the left. You're going about this wrong. It's not actually good for the culture. Yeah. Um, and I think in that is this misunderstanding where they think that it's an inversion of the left. Um, but in reality, um, the part that they're missing in this is that you have to have the explicitly Christian or explicitly transcendent articulation of this. So whereas it's not an inversion of the left, it's using strategic power, but it has to be rooted in something beyond nature itself, or it has to be beyond this material world. And so if we're arguing things just materially, it is an inversion of the left. But if we're rooting it in something beyond ourselves and beyond our own culture and time, then we actually have the ability to hopefully present a more compelling narrative, but certainly one that's not simply just parroting the ideas of another side um, in a different context. Yeah, I would agree. And I also think that a lot of what's lost in debates like that is uh, there's, there's tr long-term transformation of the culture and the short-term protection of children. And if a law protects children, then I'm in favor of it, regardless of the philosophy that may lie behind the argument for that law. I think a law that protects children, and I think that's where the transgender stuff and the current debate uh, in Florida over child sex education, that's where that's significant. How do you uh, think about the second, third world construct to, to view the world in light of the fact that it's not simply the case that from going to the second to the third world, we lost uh, an appeal to the transcendent, but that it went from maybe a transition period where that was the case in the 90s and 2000s to new moral frameworks that, that don't appeal to a world beyond our own, but but rise out of what has been called wokeness. Even the term annoys me. I mean, th 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 there there is a transcendent impulse in people it's just been um demystified and yeah. and there's there's you know just here in maryland a couple miles north you know you saw clips after the george floyd riots of crowds of white people bowing towards their perceived black superiors i mean w what do you make of that yeah i think well that points that points towards a perennial longing of the human heart we do want something transcendent, even when the transcendent is gone. And in terms of high culture, you could look at the, the modernism of the, the early 20th century. Uh, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, for example, a very sophisticated uh, uh, exposition of, of the idea that, well, God has gone, the transcendent has gone, but we really miss him. And we really <laughs> miss the transcendent and we, we're trying to, to create it for ourselves. So I think there's that dimension and what we witness today, what you're describing is the, the sort of democratized version of that, uh, you know, modernism hitting the masses a hundred years later. So there's that dimension uh, to it. I think the thing that is, would be most striking to me is that these gods are very short-lived and very temporary. Precisely the reasons that Reef outlines that you end up with a very, you end up with a system that demands virtue of people, but the definition of what is virtuous is constantly changing. Um, we might say people talk about virtue signaling. I'd want to say we live in a world where the signal is the virtue, the content changes, the action has become the virtue at this point. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so what we're dancing around here, I think, is a distinction between progressivism and maturity. Um, so you talk about how Marx inverts Hegel's um, theories or his philosophy and takes it from uh, history is just progressing towards this indefinite end to history is progressing, but it's through our economic conditions that we understand it. And I'm sure you can explain this better than I can. Um, but one of the, I think, failures um, that we're seeing in our society today is the inability to distinguish between progressivism. So the signaling is the virtue. It's constantly changing, but at least we're moving and doing something, though, like you write with Dar Darwin, we've removed any theological end and any arrival point versus a Christian um, or even traditional understanding that we're in a process of maturing. But there is an end point and there is a goal to which we're working towards. Um, and that seems to be sort of the idea that we're dancing around. But where are you seeing both sides of that playing out, both in where it's going poorly, but also the hope of like here is a maturing towards something greater than what we had before. Yeah, I, I, well, I think it's easier to answer where I'm seeing the, the bad news. <laughs> that, that's all around us. Uh, and one of the most obvious ways I think of that is, is the, the collapse of the notion of adulthood. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that, that adulthood is at a real premium at this point in time. We see that from the culture obsession with youth. We see that to the way that the people that I would regard, or my father would certainly have told me in our culture, behave in the most immature ways are often the ones we grant most authority to. We see that in politics. Uh, one of the things that that uh, I, I highlight for the students in class is, you know, 1973, 74, Watergate. One of the things that most damages Richard Nixon is the expletive deleted in the Watergate tapes transcripts. Mm -hmm. That it was shocking to the American people that in private, the president used bad language. Mm -hmm. Now... I cannot name, well, I probably know if I thought, but most politicians of whom I'm aware use bad language on a routine basis. Uh, and I think the difference has become leaders were once upon a time supposed to be people that we looked up to in order to aspire to be like them. Now we look at our leaders and we want them to be just as mediocre as we are. So I think that this loss of the idea of, of, of growing up mm -hmm. is one of the things that I would point to. In terms of where I see hope, I see hope more on a local level. I, 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 I'm impressed with the students I teach. And Grove City College is not entirely representative of the United States. We're, we're one of those colleges that tends to attract people from socially conservative backgrounds. So I, I would not extrapolate and say, all young people give me great hope for the future. But I don't think the rising generation is quite as lost sometimes as, as, as people make out. So I do see hope in young people who get it, who realize that there has to be more to life than mere material prosperity, who don't just want to learn skills, but want to be able to interpret the world and understand their place within it. So I see some hope there. One of maybe a dichotomy here would be useful, you know, a, a, a a charismatic, well-known across the world leader in the 20th century may have looked someone like Billy Graham, and today it's someone like Greta Thunberg. Is that a manifestation of the 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 change in what we ask for in our leaders that you were talking about? Yes, and I mean the thing, interesting thing about uh, Greta Thunberg is her age. Mm -hmm. You know, in what kind of insane society do we invest children with such huge moral authority? It's it's as if Rousseau's philosophy on steroids has, has taken over the, the mass mm -hmm. consciousness. Um, I would not trust a 16-year-old to perform a minor surgical procedure on me. Why am I going to trust a 16-year-old to, to set my moral vision of mm -hmm. the universe? So I, I think that the, the Thunberg phenomenon is very much rooted in the idea that, that growing up equals corruption mm -hmm. and childhood equals innocence. What do you make of the order of operations that this worldview has spread across the world? I mean, it seems like many of these ideas get incubated in American universities over the last 30 years, but their implementation accelerates dramatically outside the United States in places like Europe and Canada. And the most protracted and aggressive version of the cultural warfare happens in the United States and the, the State Department is trying to quietly get it all done across the world in the second and third worlds mm. or, you know, sociological definition of the term, not the philosophical one that you've mentioned. How, how, how do you make of how different cultures and societies have responded to this, um, you know, uh, successor ideology to use Wes Yang's uh, construct? 
Yeah, it's an interesting question. And I, and I think that the, the ones that have resisted it, t oddly, tend to be the societies that we find most worrying, mm -hmm. China and Russia, and mm -hmm. perhaps to an extent India. But India is, I think, a different, a different kettle of fish. Uh, but China and Russia have, have, have resisted this, but have only done so by being remarkably authoritarian, if not totalitarian, in their approach. I, I'm almost inclined to say that, that human beings seem to want to be mediocre and that mediocrity sells. And the internet and information technology is an easy way of selling that kind of mediocrity. Uh, we all want to be the center of the universe. We all want life to be about our performance and technology enables that. Mm -hmm. And it worries me in terms of we're now in a situation where the world is organized along lines of the nation state. But those nation states no longer have populations for whom being part of that nation state is necessarily a significant part of who they are. Uh, I was fascinated in 2020 during the time of the, the, uh, the protests and then and sometime riots surrounding George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, etc., uh, I was very surprised. There were BLM protests in Sweden. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, so, well, <laughs> Where I don't know that there's any black people. <laughs> no. Well, and they, they happened in, in Britain at the same time as there were pro-democracy protests and crackdowns going on in Hong Kong. Now, the interesting thing about Hong Kong is Hong Kong was a British colony until 1997. I remember watching live on television the Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, sign the papers, hand them over to the Chinese, jump into the little boat launch and set out across the bay as the sort of the sun really did finally set on the British Empire at that point. That's during my adult lifetime. That's not me as a three-year-old seeing that. That was me as a working, tax-paying adult witnessed that. I didn't see any reportage of any protests about what was going on in Hong Kong other than among the ethnic Chinese community mm -hmm. in Britain in 2020. It was odd that events in Minneapolis gripped the British imagination more powerfully than far more, and I'm not, I do not want to downplay the personal tragedy involved in, in, in the death of George Floyd, but what was going on in Hong Kong was a far greater world significance, far closer to the history of the United Kingdom and nobody seemed to care. Mm -hmm. And that told me a lot about the way the internet was reshaping how people thought about their identity, what events were most immediate and important to them, and it was not the narrative of their nation. Yeah, the, so, so the piece of this that, that I still haven't quite been able to figure out is, you know, let's take UK and Canada. Both mm. of them have become much more totalitarian when it comes to enforcing these novel conceptions of gender mm. um, uh, and identity than the United States yeah. has. And you know, our, our First Amendment jurisprudence yeah. may explain part of it. Yeah. But 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 how is it that what seems to be very clear kind of uh, clearly a sort of American imperial product, mm. you know, the, the this vision yeah. of gender. How how did, you know, it start in the United States, accelerate way faster in these other countries to the point of becoming the law of the land, um, such that the legal jurisprudential policy um implementation of this worldview um, is now uh, an example to American policymakers. How, how, how yeah. does that happen? It's kind of a mystery, isn't it, when you put it that way? I mean, yeah. that is that is surprising. Uh, I suspect that you'd have to look at each nation. I, I think in Canada, for example, uh, the role of the Catholic Church and the reaction against the Catholic Church probably has shaped a generation of Canadian policy relative to what we would call social conservatism. So I think there's a distinct history in, in Canada there. In Britain, uh, I think the, the suspicion of the old establishment is something that, is, that really took off after the First World War. I don't think you can understand European history and particularly British mm. history without understanding the complicity of the traditional establishment and the traditional establishment's values uh, in the mass slaughter of the First World War. Mm. I, I think the First World War was a terrible trauma. Uh, and I think it injected a certain militant iconoclasm into, into British thinking. So that I think may well have played 
a role there. I also think that in, in Britain, you know, in America, you had a fairly strong national identity up until fairly recently. I'm not sure it exists anymore. But certainly when I arrived in, in 2001, the phrase un-American was often used on the TV both by both right and left. You can only use that phrase when you have a conception of what it is to be an American. Uh, Britain has never really had a national identity. I'm mm -hmm. married to a Scot. We consider ourselves a mixed race marriage. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we are, we're different. Uh, but also Britain had a strong identity when she was a strong world power. Uh, the Suez crisis of the 1950s, when the Americans really hung us out to dry, was the sort of the moment, I think, that Britain realized she was not a world player anymore, yeah. unless she happened to be backing the Americans in what they were doing. And I think that's led to a breakdown in national identity mm -hmm. that makes us vulnerable to other identities mm -hmm. coming in and, and filling the vacuum. So perhaps yeah. that's part of the story. I, I don't want to, uh, you know, play down to, to ethnic stereotype here, but I, I'm very interested in the, the English example here. So if you'll if you'll entertain me, the, the monarchy, I think, is maybe a useful example of both ends of the, the questions you bring up in your book, right? Specifically, the unique character of the queen and, and how she seems to be almost a a throwback to mm. a different conception yeah. of institutional life and self and how one can subsume themselves into institutions as opposed to as yeah. as radical individuals and then how the british people react to the institution of the monarchy and whether that'll change dramatically after she passes how, do you, how does that example factor yeah it's interesting I, I think in my lifetime i've actually seen the the british monarchy rise in the british public's estimation mm -hmm. Uh, I, I thought that with the death of Diana, Princess of Wales in 1997, the monarchy could be in very serious trouble. Not that it would be abolished, that would be constitutionally too difficult, but that it would be radically downgraded. In actual fact, the monarchy has managed to rebuild itself pretty successfully, certainly for the Queen. Uh, the successors, I'm not so confident about, just as, as people. I wonder if, if the monarchy has been strengthened precisely because the monarchy might be the one thing that gives people a sense of national identity. We mm -hmm. don't have a constitution in the way that America has. We don't have a cult of the flag in the way America has. What we have is, is a queen that makes us who we are. So it's possible that that could be the case. So I think the, the monarchy is probably more popular now, I think, than it has been for many, many years. At the very moment when the notion of Britishness, Englishness, et cetera, et cetera, is, is, is somewhat hard to pin down. Mm -hmm. And it may be that people are just putting more and more emphasis on the monarchy as the one point of continuity mm -hmm. when everything else is is negotiable. Well, but, you know, the counterfactual factual here is interesting. You mentioned the role that the Catholic Church played in Canadians' mm -hmm. estimation of kind of um, authority and, yeah. and, and social conservatism. You know, what if, you know, because the, the monarchy in the United Kingdom has mm -hmm. been characterized by auxiliary chaos in the children mm, and the, yeah. the descendants, but but largely stability in yeah. the figure of the queen yeah. herself. What if, you know, if she had died 30 years ago, yeah. this would have been entirely reasonable. I'm not convinced she's ever going to pass at this point. <laughs> um, you, you know, and, and the monarchy itself had been characterized by institutional dysfunction yeah. like that which people have perceived in the Catholic Church. Do you think yeah. that that, what's that counterfactual? Do, do the English then completely give up on, on anything? I think that what you'd have seen then is is the monarchy would not have been able to rebuild itself mm -hmm. in the way that it did in the wake of the death of mm -hmm. uh, Diana, Princess of Wales. I think the Queen did a remarkable job on that front. Um, and I joke to, to Americans, she'll say, you know, it's great to belong to a country where I can still point to my head of state and say, <laughs> when you grow up, you want to be like that person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think when the Queen goes, we will see a generational shift and, and it will then be revealed how much of this is unique to the Queen's mm -hmm. person and how much of it is unique to the institution. I have a strong feeling that it is the uniqueness of the Queen and her ability to, to navigate very difficult waters and to do so with firmness and grace that has been key to this. So that's your bet. The successors uh, will not be able to, to I have manage. No confidence in Charles. <laughs> more, bit more confidence in William. Yeah. Uh, no confidence whatsoever in Harry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> absolutely no confidence in Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Middleton seems capable of this sort of thing, but she's not going to be a central 
you need, yeah, you need bland people. <laughs> as, uh, as the monarch and I think the queen has been wonderfully bland yeah. in a very and I mean that as a yeah. compliment yeah. Uh, Charles will be incompetent Harry would not be bland yeah. Prince Andrew well for various reasons he's mm. now uh, he's now off the uh, yeah. the roster and so would Markle and the situation around her be almost a a classic case of the concept that you've laid out in your book of of people you know uh, acting as the modern self as opposed to more classical conceptions yeah. of institutional life. Absolutely. I mean, I was I was stunned when it was reported that she'd been shocked that she had to curtsy to the Queen. It's kind of, <laughs> of course, she's the Queen and you're not. <laughs> Therefore, you have to curtsy to her. And it, it struck me that's a clash of cultures. Yeah. I went to a very traditional boys' school. It was a, a state-run school. It was a grammar school. But we were taught that the most important things in life were hierarchies and being part of the team. I think American youth are taught the most important thing in their lives is them and being an individual who can express themselves mm -hmm. in the way they choose. That's not to say one's better than the other. I have my opinion, but that's not <laughs> in to say one's better than the other, but it is to say that's a clash of cultures mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. Going back to the uh, question of sort of American Protestant institutions specifically, wh why do you think they've been so susceptible to being caught up in this this cultural torrent headed their way? Why, why, why have they seemed so incapable of resisting um, the forces that, that seek to change their church, but also yeah. um, themselves? Again, there's no simple answer to that. I mean, and, and any individual institution may have a different history. Sometimes you just come down to bad hires, bad administrative and bad faculty hires. I think one of the things that marks Protestantism out and that I've tried in some ways, in some small way to, to redress in, in my books is Protestantism generally to me, to me doesn't think in terms of general cultural theories. Protestants tend to think piecemeal about issues, whether that's deriving from the fact that they tend to have they tend to go straight to the Bible, find the text that teaches me what to think or how to behave on this issue, rather than thinking in broader terms. Uh, I, I think that's a, a weakness of Protestantism. The lack of a sense of tradition and history. Uh, again, I was struck talking with Catholic friends recently that they were talking about how to be a Catholic is automatically to tilt in an anti-modern direction. It's not that there aren't modernist Catholics, but the gravitational pull is against or away from modernism. I don't think Protestantism has anything like that in its culture. And the, the rather straightforward and blunt appeal to the Bible all the time can actually be a form of sort of anti-traditional modernism. So I think that leaves institutions vulnerable. I think a lot of uh, the more recent, I, I won't name the colleges, but I think a lot of the colleges, uh, liberal arts colleges that have drifted over the last 20, 30 years, many of them have ethnic roots. And I think when you have strong ethnic roots, you face a challenge uh, because your doctrinal, when, when your doctrinal commitments, your church commitments and your ethnic commitments are all just different facets of the same thing, that's fine. But it, let's say in the Dutch community, when the Dutch community starts to drift away from its Dutch reformed roots, then the institutions associated with that community have difficult decisions to make. Do they go with the culture to try to keep their ethnic community? Do they go with their doctrinal commitments in order to try to remain faithful to their theological tradition? They have to choose one or the other, and whichever way they choose, I think, generates problems and difficulties. Uh, so I think there's that connected to certain strands of, of, a, of higher education in America as well. And I also think that People are just weak on a lot of these things. If you're going to take a stand on some of the issues that are coming up today, it's not a question of people are just going to dislike you or send your kids elsewhere. You could find yourself facing lawsuits. You could find yourself paying a high price for taking a stand on, on LGBTQ stuff, Title IX stuff, for example. That can be very high price to pay for that. And I think most people want a quiet life. Most people will go along to get along. And when you have college administrators who do that, that's fatal for the culture of the college. 
wokeness is a religion is a uh, is an aphorism that seems mm. to be going around quite a bit these days you're a historian you're very familiar with religion do you buy it do you do you think that it's an analogy that's useful where do you think it falls short I, i've actually used the analogy relative to some strands of critical race theory mm. uh, i i think like all analogies it's it's not a perfect match mm. um and it depends how you define religion. Mm. If religion is the worship of a higher transcendent God, then no, woke, wokeism is not uh, a religion. If it's a system that is grounded ultimately in faith rather than argument, to that extent, I think it, it has a religious dimension to it. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that deviation from what I would describe as the liturgical performances then lead to being dismissed, disenfranchised as a heretic, then yes, I think wokeism is a kind of religion on, on that front. Uh, it's very interesting how the, the language that is to be used is very strictly enforced and any deviation from it is very ruthlessly punished. That's very similar to, to, to the church at some periods of, of high orthodoxy. What um, wh wh where where does the analogy break down? Um, you know, because ultimately, if if the analogy is to be useful, it's going to be as a as a template to understand how this worldview may yeah. be defeated. Yeah. Um, how do you think about the the practical side of things? You know, wh where where would drawing the lessons be inappropriate because it'll ultimately be um, unhelpful in helping reduce the influence of them in public life? Well, I, I think religion fulfills numerous sociological functions that 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 wokeism doesn't fulfill uh, it has a, a a community aspect to it that wokeism does not necessarily have it has often a sacramental system a system of signs that are important for allowing people to interpret and navigate the world so i don't think the analogy with religion works at that point as i understand the analogy it's typically being used to refer to the the sort of fanatical devotion that some people show to certain aspects of their political project. Now moving to the political right, how do you think the, the right, I mean, and historically speaking, the political right in the United States has been sort of coterminous with American Protestantism, but that is becoming less and less the case. Um, how do you think that trend is going to affect things? But then how do you think the right has been inappropriately suited to actually meet these these cultural revolutions head on why why, why do we yeah. lose why do we fail to conserve anything <laughs> right right uh, well again one would need to parse what one means by the american right at that point as, as i see it the there is no conservative movement singular at the moment you have libertarians you have populists you have traditional Burkean kind of conservatives. They're all lumped together as being on the right, but it seems to me that, that each of them would be sufficiently different as to say they're not really part of the same movement. So I think that that's a, a significant element. Um, sorry, can you remind me of the, the full question again? Well, uh, you know, how do you think that the right has similar to Evangelicalism in the United States has been susceptible to, to succumbing to these okay. cultural revolutions yeah. and, and, and why that is? I think there is a, an attempt to use raw power rather than argument that has proved po problematic. I think the right has bought into the politicization of everything, uh, the, the, the abolition of, of the pre-political strikes me as a disaster. Uh, that everything has become so polarized. So I certainly think that is, is, is part of the problem. Um, I think a failure to understand the depth of what's going on. I'm struck talking to a lot of you know, broadly conservative friends who seem to think that appointing the right Supreme Court judge <laughs> or getting the right person elected to Congress is going to solve the problem. I think a failure to understand that, that the politics of the nation is downstream from culture, that the problems we face, certainly one wants the right Supreme Court appointments. You want the right people elected. We want to be ruled by people of integrity, not people of no integrity at all. But we need to realize that what can be done by legislation is, is extremely limited. And we need to focus our energies not simply on trying to get the right legislation passed, but on rebuilding communities mm -hmm. 
at local levels. So I think that that is something that the right have, have failed to appreciate. Isn't the idea that what can be done with legislation being extremely limited, isn't that anachronistic to just the last 50 years? I mean, historically speaking, Christians in positions of political power did not believe that way at all. Why do you think we should now? Because I think it's where the culture has defaulted to in terms of power, at least in the way it imagines power to be. I mean, one of the striking things about America is, to me, is the role of the Supreme Court. And I'd use gay marriage as an example. Gay marriage has proved far less contentious in the United Kingdom because it was legislated by the Houses of Parliament. Uh, gay marriage was legislated in the United States by Justice Anthony Kennedy. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was one vote. And I think that when the key issues in culture are passed to nine members of the Supreme Court, it, it exacerbates polarization and it exacerbates the anger and the division within society. So I wonder if there's something about the American system defaulting its key issues to the Supreme Court that has fed into the situation that you're describing. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's, I mean, is, isn't the, the nature of the Supreme Court in American life essentially a devolution to more classical forms of government, the high priest council? Could well be. It could well be. It certainly is not a democratic institution as such, which courts are not meant to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there is a sense in which we don't want our courts just going with the popular will, mm -hmm. but they become the combat zones of the popular will, it mm -hmm. seems to me. Mm -hmm. Going back to the technology question, I, I think that this is very interesting. You know, the, the first riff that we had on technology is sort of focused on the the tools of medicine and biology yeah. that are now available to people. But that's not what people traditionally think about when it comes to technology. Usually people think of shiny iPhones, social media, yeah. the internet. Uh, what What is your theory of how that has exacerbated uh, all of the, the trends that, that have occurred in American life over the past 30 years? Well, again, how long you got? That's a huge <laughs> question. I, I'm a Reformation guy, as I mentioned, by background. And if you go back to the Reformation, you could write the narrative history of the Reformation in terms of Europe has one technological innovation, the printing press. And the printing press changes everything. It restructures power relations. It transforms the notion of the self. Uh, literacy rates rise. When literacy rates rise, people become more self-conscious, more politically self-conscious. And Europe plunges into 150 years of bloody warfare uh, as it realigns itself around the nature of society built upon literacy in the printing press. One could write a history like that. When you look at uh, the current situation we have in the West today, it's almost as if we're having a printing press invented every couple of months. And we have no time to assimilate and accommodate ourselves to the last technological innovation before the next one comes along. So I think that technological innovation, it plays a large role in the destabilizing of society and the sense of self at our current time. It does not surprise me that levels of anxiety among young people uh, run so high. 40% of kids at college, and Grove College where I teach is no exception to this, 40% of kids at college will see a counsellor, either on their own behalf or on behalf of a friend at some point during their college days. When I was at college, I didn't even know there was a counselling <laughs> centre. I shoot, There probably was one, but nobody ever bothered telling me about it. The high levels of anxiety we're seeing in society, I think, are technological. And when you think about it, that makes sense. When I was at college, I was part of a group of six or seven people. They were the only people whose opinion mattered to me. And we were all bodily presences in each other's lives. You're online. You could have hundreds of people affirming or tearing you down. No bodily presence to mitigate how you interact. So I think that technology is creating a very hostile, combative, and unstable place to grow up. I think it, by conning us into thinking that bodily presence is not important, it's leading to a fundamental destabilization of social relations. Do you think there's any way to restrain the influence that it has on society? Only by self-discipline, I think. Mm -hmm. Society is such, uh, my mother-in-law visited before Christmas uh, last year and stayed through New Year. Uh, it was hard to get her back to the United Kingdom 
with all the COVID relation, uh, regulations because she didn't have a smartphone. <laughs> so much of it was done on a smartphone. Uh, the world is organizing itself around smartphones and smartphones are a big part of the, the problem that I've outlined. So there is a way forward, but there has to be a concerted will at the individual level not to allow the smartphone to reshape the way we think about about the universe. I am not confident or optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, and, and this is, I think, interesting is because people always think of transhumanism as bionic eyes or yeah. robot arms um, or or even more you know, acutely things like VR, but mm. I think we're, we're there. I mean, yeah. the, the smartphone is essentially an extension of the human self yeah. at this point. And, um, it's turned it's, us into cyborgs. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, and it's happened over 10 years. Yeah. That's all it's been. Um, I, I ha and, and there's a very open question of what happens when you have an entire generation of children that know no other world. Yeah. Would they ever be able yeah. to un, unlatch themselves from their new bionic arm in the form of the smartphone. I mean, what do you see as the, do you think that that technology and its effects on, on people has matured? Are, are we seeing the sort of final state of it or, or what's the, the dystopian scenario you can see coming in the near future? Well, as, as you, as you're asking the question, I'm reminded of a couple of weeks ago, I was in an airport with my wife and uh, there was somebody with a baby crying. And they walked past us and to, to comfort the baby, they were holding up a cell phone <laughs> with a cartoon on it. And I turned to my wife and said, is, is that the latest stage in pacifiers? Mm -hmm. We no longer just plug a pacifier in, we put an eight-month-old in front of a screen. Um, I am not confident that we can turn back the tide on this one. Uh, I think it is possible that our technological ability will far outstrip our ability to survive as a society. Um, Heidegger, the German philosopher, has a fascinating comment about technology where he, he makes the point that technology, the most dangerous thing about technology is not, he doesn't use this terminology, it's somewhat anachronistic, but he essentially says, the most dangerous thing about terminology is not that it will produce weapons of mass destruction. It is that it will dehumanize us. It will alienate us from our own human nature. And I think we're at that point now. Um, if there is any hope, it's, it lies in the fact that I do think when people taste real relationships with real people in the real world, they know it's something good and it's something better. Mm. To use an extreme example, nobody on their deathbed wants to be uh, what zapping with their pastor or their loved one. They want their loved ones there holding their hands, speaking to them. I think we intuitively know that embodiment is very important. It's really a question of whether we're prepared to unhitch ourselves from technology enough to allow that thought to become a practical reality. On that optimistic note, uh, <laughs> Dr. Truman, how can people keep up with what you're doing? Uh, tell us a little bit about your your new book and how people can follow you. Well, I, I don't do a lot on social media. Uh, I, I resolved a few years ago that two things, that if I was going to get fired for an opinion, it was going to be an opinion expressed in a paragraph, okay. not, not in a tweet. Okay. So I, I don't do Twitter. Uh, I write uh, regularly at First Things, uh, firstthings.com. And I also do an op-ed column for World Magazine, which is available, I think, at wng.org, I think, is the, uh, the website. So that's where you can read my writings. I have a small book that's just come out. It's a, in part a summary of the bigger book on the, the nature of the human self, but it also contains some further reflections upon the crisis of national identity and the, the power of technology in reshaping our imaginations. That's called Strange New World. It's just been published. And as of this moment, still available on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> it's not gone the way of my friend Ryan Anderson's book <laughs> as yet. Yeah. Well, that's how you'll know you're really controversial. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, led on target, so to he speak. Did the, he did the foreword for it, by the way. I've done that's my wonderful. best to get cancelled by Amazon because I had him do the foreword. Ryan so. is a, a good friend and a former guest <laughs> on this podcast. We actually yeah. went out to his farm and uh, with some drones and then taped it uh, in person there. So wow. It's, wow. Uh, people should go back and watch that after they get, <laughs> they get done with this episode. Um, Dr. Truman, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. It's been fun.
Did you enjoy your hour plus of British accent? We we certainly hope you did. Um, I thought that was a fantastic episode. Emma, what did you think? Yeah, it was incredible for someone who studied political theory and wants to believe it had any sort of use in the world today. Um, this speaker justified it. In more ways than <laughs> one. So I am personally just feeling very good yes. about my own life decisions yes, right now. All, all of you that that decided to become theory cells in college, uh, fear not. You can, in <laughs> fact, earn a living at some point, although uh, I certainly wouldn't expect becoming a professor like Dr. Truman. I'm not convinced that that job is going to exist in the way that it does in uh, by the time that any of the current PhD students get their job. But um, there there is hope for you yet in, in contributing to public life. Um, I was especially interested in sort of uh, playing to ethnic stereotypes during this episode and asking him about the queen. I think that it's not clear to me that that institution is going to survive after um, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, I think that she is probably one of the most dignified people in Western public life. And after her, there there will be no other like her. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then beyond that, I thoroughly enjoyed the way that we then discussed that within like the United States context. So Sarab made the fantastic point, right, that like you're seeing these trends in the United States, but they're taking root in other countries more. So I think it's prompting a lot of thought, um, like what our version of this is and what it looks like in the future to sort of reclaim that. Um, so the United States is inherently a Protestant nation, much to the disagreement of Sarab and nearly every <laughs> Catholic listening. Um, but what does it look like when the Protestant church is in big events? evangelical leaders are accommodating and sort of seeding um, these woke cultural points today. Um, and what does it look like to sort of regain that place as a moral uh, authority within society when you have entire movements that are seeking to justify themselves on the basis of their own self um, and rejecting any sort of authority whatsoever? Heady stuff. Um, we hope you'll Rate and review the podcast if you enjoyed it. Five stars only, please. We we don't believe in nuance here. Uh, anything <laughs> below five stars is evil. Um, and uh, be sure to send in any questions you might have um, at uh, podcast at AmericanMoment.org. And we'll see you next week on another episode of Moment of Truth. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more. Thank you.